debate of the 2023 Atlantic Coast Conference Debate Championship. What makes this a fascinating and interesting tournament is that it's actually a compromise, which is kind of rare in the debate world. It's a compromise between formats. The ACC institutions represent a huge diversity of debate formats and styles, most schools participating in different interesting versions of intercollegiate debate. But they come together once a year, and then once a year they compromise on the format, they compromise on the topic, and they compromise on meeting each other on the battle of wits to have a debate championship representing the best and brightest of the ACC. I'm joined today by our co-chair, Dave Steinberg from the University of Miami, and I'm Jared Atchison from Wake Forest University. We have the pleasure of introducing two teams that represent the culmination of an entire days of debates that have taken place at the 2023 ACC Debate Championship hosted at George Washington University. We are in particular thankful, of course, to the Atlantic Coast Conference Academic Consortium, which has a choice every year about what programming to support. And for nine years straight, they have supported the ACC Debate Championship, which we believe is a sign that the ACC has the reputation of not just being phenomenal at sports and traditional uh, competition on the field, but bringing brilliant students to both the athletic field and to academic competitions. The ACC Consortium continues to support our opportunities to bring students from the ACC together to have conversations in this incredible format, which is designed for a public audience. It matches research, it matches preparation, but it also is designed for a communication event to be viewed by you right here in the live stream. So thank you so much for joining us. In addition to thanking the ACC, we'd like to thank our host, Paul Hayes from George Washington University. Thank you very much. If you don't know Paul, Paul is a pillar in the civic engagement movement, which is designed around the idea that debate should not just be limited to obscure banquets rooms where in a hotel people argue with each other, but instead to channel the productive forces of the hours and countless speech times of practice that have taken place into a setting that can be beneficial to society at large. And as a pillar of that, uh, Paul Hayes has continued to support the ACC Debate Championship with his time and energies, and we are deeply thankful for that. In addition to the amazing students that we have, we'll introduce in a moment, we'll do one last thank you to our panel of judges. Today, we are joined in our final round by James Rowland, who is the Senior Director for the Center of Civic and Community Engagement at Emory University. Round of applause for James Rowland. <laughs> we are also thankful to have Paul Hayes, who's not only chosen to be the host, but has agreed to judge the final round. He is the George Washington University Director of Debate and the Director of the Transatlantic Diplomacy Initiatives for IBF International Consulting. Round of applause for Paul Hayes. <laughs> and not, last but not least, and agreeing to once again serve as the chair for the championship debate, Ed Lee is the Senior Director of Inclusivity at Emory's College of Arts and Sciences and also the Senior Advisor to Emory's Barclay Forum for Debate, Deliberation, and Dialogue. Thank you so much, Ed Lee, for being here. <laughs> Dave and I are gonna step out of the way and let the two amazing teams do the next part, which is the fun part. On the affirmative, we have Wake Forest University, represented by Jessica Klein and T.C. Perez. On the negative, we have Florida State University entering as the undefeated team on the negative with Maya Anderson and Nicole Sandoval. With that being said, we'll let, turn it over to the debaters to take us to an amazing debate championship place where we can hear the best and the brightest of the ACC. Thank you so much. The number of people unable to afford a healthy diet around the world rose by 112 million to almost 3.1 billion. Up to 345 million people in 82 countries were moving towards starvation, 2.5 times the number of acutely food insecure people before the pandemic began. But it's not just starvation we need to consider, it's also hidden hunger. This is when someone gets enough calories, but not enough of the nutrients they need. Two billion people are at risk of unnecessary death. 
Fortunately, fish can provide those nutrients. Emily Petsko of Oceana notes in 2021, locally available fish could provide more than 60% of the vitamin A and zinc that children under two need each day. Fish is a micronutrient powerhouse that tackles hidden hunger. More than 2 billion people suffer from micronutrient deficiency, maternal mortality, childhood stunting, blindness, birth defects, and compromised brain and immune function. If overfishing continues to deplete the fish populations, it will further deprive women and chi children of a healthy, nutrient-dense meal. As fish become scarcer, they will become more dear, leaving the neediest families in poor countries even more nutritionally disadvantaged, broadening the gulf between the haves and the have-nots. We can reverse course by enacting policies that allow collapsed fisheries to rebound. Demand for food will double by 2050. We simply don't have the capacity to expand production on land. Open ocean aquaculture is the only alternative. Ashif Qasim of The Guardian stated in July 2022, demand for food could double by 2050. How are we going to produce that much food? 40% of arable land is already devoted to food production. Fish farming is the only is the only one that has far by far the biggest potential for expansion as companies experiment with fish feed derived from products such as insect protein or bacterial based protein in order to minimize the pressure on wild caught fish stock aquaculture could result in a smaller environmental footprint compared with the production of other forms of animal protein. Global fish stocks are in rapid decline now. Open ocean aquaculture alleviates that pressure. Kassam of the Guardian stated again in July 2022, farms could ease pressure on wild fish populations in 1974. About 10% of fish stocks were being depleted too quickly. By 2017, that was up to 34%. The deep sea locations of offshore farms are also seen as a plus because stronger currents may dilute waste and avoid the coastal degradation often seen in fish farms located in bays and estuaries. Because of these issues and more, we defend that it would be beneficial to expand open ocean aquaculture. The further development of open ocean aquaculture would likely happen in U.S. Eco exclusive eco economic zones. It is a great opportunity to both serve as a model and serve as a springboard for further ocean conservation. Mark Gunther has reported on business and sustainability for Fortune in 2018. Aquaculture can be a major tool for conservation. It can conserve wild stocks, conserve habitats. We have a great opportunity to show the rest of the world how it can be done in a sustainable way. Aquaculture has a clear advantages over other types of animal source food production for human consumption. It's a huge opportunity for the planet. We have the science, the text, the waters, the largest EEZ of any country in the world, and we have the demand. No matter how you look at it, the U.S. should get involved in marine aquaculture. It's better to grow fish responsibly close to home than to import seafood from places where regulations are weak. That is essential. Oceans sustain all life on Earth, the World Economic Forum notes in 2016. Without healthy oceans, our life on Earth would be severely challenged, perhaps impossible. The oceans are life support systems for all living beings. Earth can thrive without land. It cannot exist without an ocean. Far better for concerns like global climate change, too. McDonald of the University of Hawaii, a Sea Grant College program in 2018, writes that farming fish is better for the climate than raising land-based animals. Fish are much better than cows, pigs, and chickens at converting feed into food because they are cold-blooded and don't need to use energy to warm themselves. They don't need to fight gravity and have smaller skeletons. A pescatarian diet consisting of fish and vegetables, but no meat, generated half of the carbon footprint of a diet heavy in meat. Climate change is an existential threat, and meat consumption is a major contributor. Dan Brook reports in 2020, citing the UN and the ICC, climate change, an existential threat to humanity. The human appetite for animal flesh is driving force behind virtually every major category of environmental damage now, threatening the human future. The production of meat and dairy contributes significantly to the emissions of three major greenhouse gases associated with climate change. Livestock emit 16% of the world's annual production of methane. The animals we eat emit 21% of all carbon dioxide that can be attributed to human activity. Open ocean aquaculture is inevitable. The U.S. is more likely to do it sustainably and set a model for others to follow. Hawaiian currents in particular. Jo Josh McDonald of the University of Hawaii again in 2018. Blue ocean macroculture cannot feed fish farm is the only commercial open ocean aquaculture 
operation in the U.S. It may be modeled for the industry that many believe is primed for go goal growth. The NOAA and EPA and other organizations are ensuring that little environmental impact occurs through the advancement, advancements in technology with evidence-based science and improved practices. They promote open ocean aquaculture as more climate resilient, means of producing animal protein that land-based agriculture and necessary pieces of the puzzle to address the climate crisis with feeding a growing population, despite the debate trends that show aquaculture is a growing portion for global seafood production. I am now open for process. Is everyone ready? Yeah, cool. Time starts now. Alrighty, so let's start off uh, about your argument about starvation. So actually, let's talk about the model of open, uh, open ocean aquaculture. What kind of model would we be implementing in the affirmative world? So in the world of the affirmative, we forward the most sustainable and most likely form of aquaculture, which is this model the U.S. has started uh, to develop with this Hawaiian example we read at the very end of the one scene. And what does that look like specifically? You say it's sustainable, but I'm not really sure what that means. Sure. So we think that the U.S. model is twofold. One, there's aquacultures that exist to feed hungry populations, so you can Another phrase for it would be fish farming. And then there are aquacultures that exist as a type of ocean conservation. So when you uh, set up an aquaculture, you have to create basically a miniature ecosystem. Mm -hmm. And when you do that, you can revitalize dead zones that were once places where nothing could happen because there wasn't enough oxygen into a place of life, which revitalizes the ocean, which gets us to our climate change scenarios, et cetera. Okay, so you're talking about like these mini ecosystems that yeah. are in the ocean, right? So is, are you talking about multi-trophic aquaculture? Um, we have, we'll defend the example of our Hawaiian, uh, the Hawaiian blue ocean aquaculture. I'm not really sure what your question so, is. So, okay, so, but the way that aquaculture specifically works is you create a tiny ecosystem where everything can feed off of each other and whatnot, and you avoid, like, the harms of, like, aquaculture. Um, at least in the conservation section of what we believe the U.S. would be forwarding as aquaculture, yes. Okay, okay, so we can say it's like multi-trophic. Because um, I mean, that, that's like the same model. So let's talk about like this fish farming and this demand, yeah, let's talk about fish farming. So you say that um, currently right now, fish, how are fish being fed right now in these aquaculture situations? Yeah, so we think that the status quo has a massive problem with the way we try and feed fish in aquacultures. Traditionally, they are fed with uh, fish meal that is primarily made up of other ground up fish. And that can result in health deficiencies of that for the fish that that gets fed to. And it's also really expensive. Okay, so you talk about, I didn't, I, that's not what I would, were you asking what? I was gonna ask another partners? question. Okay, I just wanna make sure you don't be answering what you're looking for. Yeah, so right now in the status quo, we use fish meal, right? In the status quo, correct. Okay, so what are you talking about like this insect protein? Yeah, so we, uh, our evidence talks about insect proteins and other types of microbial, uh, microbial proteins. Uh, we also think that uh, soy and vegetables are a good example here of the way companies are transitioning to cheaper, healthier, safer types of uh, food for these carnivorous fish in aquaculture okay. uh, to avoid the kind of health deficits okay. of ground up fish and also the cost. Okay, cool. So let's talk about you say that oceans, like conserving oceans is our number one priority, is that right? I think we have lots of priorities. I think feeding the world and avoiding climate change are both major priorities. And, but you say that we, in the meanwhile of doing that, we need to make sure that we conserve the ocean as much as possible, right? Uh, we think that the most effective way to conserve, conserve the ocean is to do the affirmative plan and that it's a good idea. Okay, but you would say that like protecting the ocean is like one of the things that we should be using to evaluate the round today. We will likely weigh in the final affirmative rebuttal. <laughs> okay, 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 okay. I think you're admitted. All right, all right. I'll, I'll move on and ask one more question. Sure. On climate change, how do we know that like aquaculture is going to shift away, or like food's going to shift away from aquaculture to livestock? Sorry, what can? Uh, you might have your question backwards. Do you mind asking it one more time? All right. How do we know that food production is going to shift from livestock to off? Yes, you did have it backwards. Okay. Uh, so we think that uh, at economies of scale, that more people will want to eat fish because it'll be so much cheaper than, say, beef, which is a major cause of uh, methane 
production. Um, and I think that's particularly true in the status quo as food has skyrocketed in price 20 to 30 percent. Okay, since COVID. Awesome, thank you. Yep. Ready? Oh wait, really quick, some thank yous. Thank you all for being here today. Congratulations to my opponents for making it this far. Thank you, judges. Everyone ready? Okay, I will start our time. Maya and I negate the acceleration of open ocean aquaculture development would be desirable. The acceleration of open, open ocean aquaculture development would not help small and local fisheries as some may contend. Instead, Food and Water Watch in 07 reports that while aquaculture may help a few foreign companies, multinational corporations have begun to wield the load of aquaculture. Indeed, they say that unlike many kinds of fishing, offshore aquaculture is not likely to develop as a small family owned business. It would be a larger scale corporate activity. Moreover, Clark and Paulson in 08 writes that aquaculture is just the latest method for capitalists to commodify, invest in, and develop new elements of nature that that previously existed outside the political economic competitive sphere. They further that similar to livestock agribusiness, aquaculture would need to produce more and more marine life in order to feed the fish. The inherent contradiction in ex extracting fish meal is that industries must increase their exploit exploitation of marine life in order to feed the farm raised fish, thereby increasing the pressure on wild stocks to an even larger extent. The first disadvantage is an increased risk of cancer. Salmon production is going to continue increasing if we accelerate open ocean aquaculture. The World Wildlife Found Organization in 2020 tells us that salmon consumption organization or uh, salmon consumption worldwide is three times higher than it was in 1980. It has become one of the most popular fish species in the U.S., Europe, and Japan. In fact, salmon aquaculture is the fastest growing uh, food production system in the entire world. Salmon farming is increasing in demand, but this increase could have deadly consequences. According to Davis in 2021, researchers found high concentrations of man-made chlorinated industrial chemicals called, pol called polychlorinated biphenyl or PCB, uh, or PCB. Regular consumption of farm salmon could increase the risk of developing cancer due to high concentrations of the chemical. Risk analysis shows that eating farm-raised salmon regularly doubles the risk of cancer, detracting its beneficial effects. Eating farm salmon more than once a month is enough to increase the risk of cancer. Foreign continues this research writing that human cancer risks associated with the consumption of similar quantities of wild salmon con contaminated with PCBs are higher than cancer risks associated with the uh, with consumption of similarly quantities of wild salmon. Additionally, modest consumption of farmed fit salmon raised exposure levels considerably above recommended intakes for adults in the United States. The American Cancer Association says that there are 16, 000, or 1,600 cancer deaths per day. An increase in cancer salmon is problematic because the amount of people consuming new food does not change in the affirmative world. Dorico 2019 writes, that the issue of food scarcity results from distribution rather than supply. Um, uh, as enough supply exists to feed almost the entire world in the status quo. This means that increases in food supply will largely be consumed by the same people who do not suffer food scarcity if you affirm. Thus, there is you know, no unique decrease in food scarcity, but there is a unique risk in the risk of cancer for current consumers. The second disadvantage is an acceleration of interbreeding. Animal husbandry increases the risk of interbreeding between relatives. According to Douglas Tape 99, animal husbandry confines populations to small spaces, which significantly increases the risk of animals accidentally breeding with relatives. This undermines the precision of selective breeding, increasing the risk of harmful conditions being passed on to offspring. This leads Tape to conclude that interbreeding is inevitable within aquaculture. Problematically, Charlie Waters in 2020 furthers that harmful conditions leave the inbred fish with a worse chance for survival than non-inbred fish. This makes selective breeding highly inefficient, leading to decreases in fish population and food supply. The impacts here are worrying. Inevitable inbreeding in open ocean aquaculture means that yields will be lower, attempts at selective breeding will be useless, and fish populations will be less fit for survival. 
This is dire, as we need to address the decrease, or this will lead to a decrease in the food supply. The EPA writes that a decrease in the food supply can increase domestic prices of food, leading in Mon 11 to conclude that a 10% increase in food prices drives an additional one or 10 million people below the poverty line. Additionally, a decrease in the food supply leads to an increase in starvation. The UN says that famine can occur due to food insecurity, more uh, caused by jeopardizing agriculture. Moreover, they say that an increase in food prices may drive 100 million people into hunger. The third disadvantage is harmful algae blooms. Focal 2020 warns that aquaculture habit habitats release excessive waste onto the surrounding environment. This dramatically increases the level of nitrogen and phosphorus in the waters. Unfortunately, this leads to harmful algae blooms. The EPA explains that algae blooms occur when an excess of nitrogen and phosphorus cause algae overgrowth. It consumes oxygen and sunlight from outer water plants, decreasing the oxygen level. When algae blooms grow large enough, they become harmful algae blooms that release toxic chemicals. This is why Vocal confirms that the nitrogen and phosphorus from aquaculture have uniquely increased harmful algae blooms. The impact is food security. The EPA writes that harmful algae blooms lead to dead zones, which are bodies of water where aquatic life cannot survive because of low oxygen levels. Gokul concludes that harmful algae blooms are associated with a broad range of ecological impacts, including increased mortalities of wild and farmed fish, displacement of indigenous species, and alterations to marine food webs. For all of these reasons, we urge a negative ballot. Thank you. Open for process? Yes. Okay. I want to start on the cancer disadvantage. I'm curious what types of cancer is eating salmon known to cause? Okay, so specifically, the uh, the evidence doesn't specifically link to the sort of cancer that it is like it causes, but there is a significant association with the increase in cancer. Sure. Uh, do you have evidence that says all types of fish meal are known to include this chemical that you linked to these certain types of cancers? That all types of fish meal, like that, it's consistent uh, industry wide that yeah. this chemical is present in fish meal. Yeah, so Foreign specifically says that there is a specific risk associated with this, specifically with the PCP. Okay. Um, on the question of inbreeding, I'm, I missed the date of your sources. What, 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 when, were, when was your evidence from? Of inbreeding? Yeah. Uh, Tape is 99, Waters is 20. Okay. Um, on the question, actually, let's stick on inbreeding for a second. Given that some of your evidence is from 1999, how does it assume the introduction of genetic diversity and uh, changes in production that have been implemented into salmon farming since the 90s? Okay, first, the 99, the interbreeding argument is completely different than the salmon argument, so it doesn't have anything to do with salmon. Second of all, we give you two cards. One is 99 just tells you, like, date, or Tate is 99 tells you the biology, and biology like doesn't really change as you go, the sure, warning is still there. But the Charles, the Waters 20 evidence specifically talks about the current uh, culture of aquaculture sure, sure. now. So on the question of distribution, uh, what is the evidence to suggest that uh, the inc that an increase in the amount of fish would cause the same amount of distribution? I guess I'm asking, in the uh, most technical of terms, what is the internal link between uh, an increase of uh, surplus and distribution problems? So are you assuming that there's going to be a surplus? Well, let's imagine that the app happens and the uh, production is uh, increasing, so we have lots of fish. Why would we still be bad at distributing it? Okay, one, I would say like I'm not an economist, so I can't get into all of those details. Sure. But two, I would say that the link still works because one, we see like these distribution problems have continued on and on and on. Actually, I have like a few reasons. One is because like food prices cost way too much. Two is because of like bad governance, and three is because of like bad infrastructure. Sure. We just don't have these ways to if, like if deliver evidence, the fish. I'm curious if your evidence is predictive of offshore aquaculture, however, and, and I, that question would apply to all three dissabs. Is are any of your cards in the context of offshore aquaculture? Yeah. Can you cite cite specific lines that talk about offshore aquaculture? Yeah. So, well, I'm not gonna go through like the entire thing. But sure, for that's okay. So on the question of food prices, I mean, I back where I was on distribution, that's okay. Back where I was on uh, distribution questions, your first argument was that food prices 
uh, make distribution a problem, given that uh, an acceleration of the amount of aquaculture worldwide would eventually result in this sort of economy of scale. Why would food prices uh, still be a concern? Wait, 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 Supply wait, wait. goes up. We should totally, go down. like, we should, you're just totally making an assumption that it would lead to an economy of scale. We affirm the resolution that says we should globally accelerate. Um, but you can't be on, you can't. But we're not fiating that. <laughs> we, we think that's okay. a natural consequence of how you, the resolution has been interpreted. But you're saying that the resolution means that automatically we get this entire supply of fish? What about like our disadvantages that say that doesn't happen? So I, that's my, my, con, my question is in the context of the app on its best terms, but we're ha we'll debate out the disad certainly. Um, that's time on cross. Okay. Yeah, sweet. Can you pass me? Can I just stand? Can I just stand? Thank you. <laughs> It's just going to be straight down. Um, is anyone not good? You all are good? Mm -hmm. Shipments? Cool. This resolution asks the question, would be desirable? That has to compare two options. They have not given you a counter proposal, so that means they have to win that the status quo is a better option than the affirmative. We have multiple reasons why this is not the case. First is hunger. Affording a healthy diet is a prerequisite to living. Right now, 3.1 billion people are unable to afford a healthy diet and 345 million are starving. Hidden hunger due to nutrient deficits are going to kill 2 billion people without the help of vitamins and nutrients in fish. Only expanding aquacultures can solve current unsustainable industries. Second is modeling. Only open ocean aquacultures can springboard U.S. modeling, which ensures sustainable open ocean aquacultures that have prevent models that hurt the environment and marine species and allow for more investment in sustainable consumption models. This has two impacts. First is the ocean. It sustains all life on Earth. Every species and ecosystem will die if the status quo continues. Second is climate change. It's an existential threat that only a transition to, food produ uh, to fish production can solve. Only the plan by sustainable tra sustainably transitioning to fish is able to solve any of these impacts. The negative says you do not need to address that, and you should consider a negative ballot pulling the trigger against thousands of lives and future generations that require food, a sustainable climate, and a healthy ecosystem to live. They have posited four, four reasons why you, should re why you should reject the affirmative. First is that it causes the crowd out of smaller farmers. More aquacultures means at the store it is cheaper to, it is cheaper to buy. It is cheaper to buy foods, which means that there is low-cost fish. The app reduces the price of seafood by increasing the supply of it, which means that costs would be lower in the first place. Marine aquaculture is accessible and lowers costs. Coast of Pier et al. in 2021 says that Belton believes that marine aquaculture is only accessible to large corporations. On the contrary, there are numerous examples of small marine production where this is not the case. Not all salmon farms are large, are large scale. Governments have it within their power to regulate and manage marine aquaculture to restrict the size of the operation. This ignores economies of scale. They fail to acknowledge that increased sales bring cost benefits due to the increased efficiencies in technology. Reduced prices would render farm products more widely available in a free market economies worldwide. Increased large scale food production is driven by investment that would be contingent on attractive pricing. The next argument was about why acceleration is bad or capitalism is bad. And in the status quo, there are problems. Acceleration would never happen otherwise. It's not sustainable. All of their dissents prove this, but this is an advantage for the affirmative, for the affirmative because it means we create a more sustainable approach with the US as a model for creating a, a sustainable model of acceleration. Their next argument is about cancer. One, our app is about far more than salmon. Mullet, mollusk, then other forms of fish can be successfully grown to make sure that omega-3 fatty acids are better to protect against hidden hunger. Second, it's farm fish are the problem of the status quo due to dioxin eating fish pellets. Douglas Gambain notes in, in January of 2004 that the best explanation for big dose of dioxin is that farm fish are eating food pellets mostly derived from ground up fish. The added risk of dioxin is more than compensated for by the benefits of eating salmon. That's because salmon, an oily fish, is rich in omega-3 fatty acids. 
Third is that expanding aquaculture means the U.S. would get involved. Alan Lynch in 2017 notes that the U.S. has said that the country with the greatest potential to make a significant contribution to aquaculture is the U.S. <coughs> one tenth of a percent of uh, one tenth percent of U.S. managed waters can produce an amount of seafood equal to the total wild catch. Fourth is that advancement of U.S. aquaculture solves alternatives to fish meal already that are already developed. Josh McDonald's from the University of Hawaii in 2018 notes that low use of fish meal and feed, minimal use of antibiotics, and well-managed nutrients, and minimal escapes are actually norm in the U.S., not the exception. They developed a substitutable fish meal for methane gas, and can't, uh, we are, uh, agree that cancer is inevitable, so it's try or die for the affirmative to solve any of their offense. They say that food insecurity is caused by distribution. Even if that's true, the affirmative would increase the supply of food, which economies of scale could solve. That was above their inbreeding argument. Salmon farms around the world have been able to navigate inbreeding. Their evidence from 1999 needs an update because salmon farms have allowed for genetic diversity, which prevents inbreeding in the first place. This also assumes that fish will escape, uh, would, that will escape will interbreed. And farm fish can't compete. Salmon farms prove. Josh McDonald from the University of Hawaii in 2018 notes that offshore native fish farms reg and uh, native fish farms and regulators say that releases do not cause lasting damage because can't, they can't effectively compete with any of the native species. Few farm salmon have been able to survive in the wild. Their last argument is about ad algae bloom. Deep ocean currents means we saw the algae bloom. That's the Kosong evidence we read in the first affirmative speech, which is that deep sea locations are superior because it's, it is able to dilute waste. But the status quo aquaculture allows that, which means that this is offense for us because the affirmative solves the status quo unsustainable models of aquaculture that allow for algae blooms in the first place. We solved their offense. They have not answered our fundamental claim about we, how we increase ocean health writ large. None of their arguments assume deep ocean currents and people need fatty omega-3 fatty acids to live. So all of our offense outweighs. That was all in the overview. This means that you are going to write an affirmative ballot immediately because we have presented three, re three reasons as to why you need to vote for us. Hunger, oceans, and climate change are all individual impacts that outweigh all of their offense. Nothing that they have presented to you has a terminal impact that is larger than what we have presented. We have presented existential threats that outweigh all of their offense, and we have provided inroads to solving anything that they have presented, which means you are already going to write an affirmative ballot. Okay. I'm just going to take up the water and then I'm going to go cross up. Just let me know. cross up. I'm good. Um, I will begin on my first word. So I first kind of wanted to talk about um, how you talk about, sorry, that was repetitive. Um, okay. Deep sea locations diluting waste, yet the plan you kind of propose is already in use by the United States. How do you suggest that algae blooms are occurring in the status quo when the plan you're attempting to, or sorry, not plan. Okay. Your, your proposition is essentially just trying to accelerate what's already, what the U.S. is already. I think you're like misunderstanding what our affirmative has said. We provided a model, which was the Hawaii model, which was a sustainable model that did not have algae blooms as an issue. Algae blooms across the U.S. are happening, across, like outside of the U.S. are happening now. The affirmative is necessary in order to solve those because we create, use the U.S. as a model in order to create sustainable models that prevent algae blooms. So that means other countries like China that already have aquacultures will adopt that model and then we'll be able to solve for algae blooms across the globe. Right, so are you saying that the United States currently has no algae blooms? What? No, I'm saying that aquacultures are necessary in order to solve those because we have read evidence about how there are two different types of aquacultures. There's conservation aquacultures, then there's consumption art, uh, aquacultures, um, which Jess referenced in her first cross-ex, and those prevent algae blooms because they are sustainable. So regardless of whether or not aqua, there are algae blooms, that isn't necessarily tied to aquacultures. All right, um, thank you so much. Um, I also wanted to talk about um, this economies of scale. Can you kind of elaborate how if fish yields are low, um, from these uh, open water aquaculture, how are we going to adjust for an economy of scale? Well, A, you haven't read evidence about that, but B, we also made an argument about like when you increase the supply of fish, that makes it cheaper. So regardless of whether or not, I'm, wait, which argument is this in reference to? The cost argument or? Um, well, you just bring up economies of scale a lot, and I just uh, wanted to- I just said increase supply of fish, yeah. lower the cost of fish across. That means that people can actually access food because they're hungry and they want to eat cheap fish. Okay. Um, 
So you say that the U.S. Uh, will kind of teach other countries about this um, model that you're presenting. Um, how do you know that this is going to happen if there's you know, other things that maybe aren't as convenient or sustainable that are more beneficial to the country? Okay, so we read a piece of evidence in the 1AT that went uncontested in the 1AT. This, this piece of evidence said that the United States is the most likely candidate and needs to lead, and is the most likely candidate to lead in aquaculture because they already have a model of sustainable aquaculture. And other countries look at the United States for like environmental regulations and things like that. So, like for example, like if we sign on to the Paris Climate Accord, more countries are more likely to sign on because the United States did it. It's about to, like creating a model. You have read zero evidence to contest that model. So would you say a country like China, who the United States is in constant competi competition with, are you implying that maybe they would take notes from the United States on how we model? I actually think that argument is an argument for us. Because if the United States and China are constantly competing, then when China sees how well the United States is doing with these aquacultures, they will want to create more sustainable models so that they are able to create the same sort of sustainable profits that they are able to do. Because also, it's more cost efficient, which we read evidence about. Okay, thank you for that. Um, so, I really quick, I just wanted to ask. So we talked. Nicole talked about in uh, her opening how there's the we have the food that is necessary to feed everyone. It's just a matter of getting it to them. In the affirmative world, how are we supposed to like assume that bad infrastructure can be like eliminated with the introduction of so? Food? Well, we think that if food lowers in price, it's more likely to di be distributed to like populations across the United States. So if we lower the price of fish, that means people will be able to get access to those nutrients, which are necessary in order to prevent hunger. That's fine. Thank you so much. So the uh, affirmative side is trying to talk about these impacts of climate change and um, you know, increasing uh, food supplies and reducing hunger. But on the negative side, we're talking about reducing cancer deaths caused by these salmon that is being ingested in um, open water aquaculture. We're also talking about um, you know, maintaining ecological sustainability in terms of salmon pop populations uh, in inbreeding. Um, and finally, our as you know, our third disadvantage was relating to algal blooms, which these algal blooms cause dead zones, which is a really, really big impact of these, this open water aquaculture. In the United States, we still see horrible algal blooms that are constantly occurring. And so adopting a system in which we accelerate a, something that contributes to these algal blooms just doesn't make sense if we're trying to prioritize economic stability and just reduce um, some of these harms. So I'm going to go into um, my opponent's case a little bit. Um, so first, they start out by saying that um, starvation will kill two billion, but they don't necessarily suggest how open water aquaculture itself is going to solve this. It doesn't suggest how these people are going to access the food. It doesn't. We don't really see this happening um, in actuality. They also talk about how every species in the ocean will die if the status quo continues, but they also don't address all of the. Uh, harms to the species in the ocean that's going to come if we accelerate open water aquaculture. They don't talk about how these species are affected by dead zones. They just don't address this whatsoever. Species are going to die because of dead zones. Um, so additionally, they talk about how uh, there's numerous examples of small co corporations that do um, these open water aquaculture practices, but they don't give us any actual examples. We know that most open water aquaculture right now is being perpetuated by large corporations. So moving on to the, um, the cancer point, uh, they talked about how um, there's more fish than just salmon, and even if that were the case, like, this, the benefits that come from salmon outweigh the cancer risks, which uh, Nicole already told you in her first um, opening uh, speech that the um, salmon is one of the most popular species of fish to buy. It is the fastest growing source of protein. Um, and so they talk about, um, how fish get their, their PCBs from fish meal, 
and sort of this idea of like the cancer being inevitable. So from this idea of fish meal, um, we just see this perpetuated if we accelerate the use of open water aquaculture. So this is a big one. I wanted to talk about inbreeding. A big point of their uh, response to this is that our evidence is old, which actually isn't true. The T99 evidence is um, specifically explaining more so um, how inbreeding happens and why, like it's suggesting that it's a problem. The actual evidence that we use to show why um, it's so harmful. It's from 2020. If my opponents think that that's old evidence, then I feel like most of the evidence in all of our cases isn't going to fly. Um, so the selective breeding kind of makes it so that these yields that they want to get out of um, open water aquaculture, specifically their model that uh, is basically the same as integrated multi-trophic level aquaculture, um, it essentially makes it so those benefits aren't going to happen, those yields aren't going to happen. When we selectively breed fish, we pick characteristics that we look for and we like. Um, when we decrease the size of the genetic population, we're going to continue seeing those inbreeding and those uh, yields that we're looking for, those specific characteristics that we want, aren't going to keep occurring. Um, so it just is going to decrease the amount of fish being able to be sold because yields will be lower, less fish will be, you know, circulating, etc. Um, so I, I would definitely say that the ne negative side wins on this argument. So third, the algae blooms. They talk about how deep sea locations dilute waste, yet the model they give us is currently in use by the United States. And like I said earlier, we're having really, really bad problems with toxic algae blooms everywhere in this country. It is a pervasive issue. So they also talk about how there's no terminal, terminal impact here. So their, um, their impacts outweigh, which is just isn't the case. Um, we told you the impact here. We're seeing dead zones. We're seeing animals dying. We're seeing food webs collapse because they can't get the nutrients they need. They can't access what they need because of the algae blooms. The uh, open water aquaculture that they're preserving, or sorry, <laughs> uh, promoting is going to do nothing but just simply um, accelerate this from occurring. Um, so moving on to why you're really, really going to be voting with Nicole and I in this round. Um, first of all, um, we talk about why the, um, how many people are going to die because of uh, can cancer, um, you know, cancer numbers. So we give you an actual number, like a tangible piece of evidence that you can see. We tell you 1,600 people die from cancer a day. If we accelerate the use of open water aquaculture, we're saying that more people are going to die from cancer, they're going to get cancer, and it's just not going to be something that we want to see happen in the affirmative plan. Um, additionally, they talk about this, this US model. It's not going to spread to other countries because if it was so successful and if it were so beneficial, it already would have. It's happening in the status quo, like they said. If it was so, um, you know, if it had all the benefits that they said, the other countries would have already seen it and already acted on it. Additionally, the risk of cancer outweighs this. Um, you know, 700 people dying a day outweighs the possibility that maybe some countries will want to get together. Uh, and work on a, a system of aquaculture. So for all of these reasons, I urge a negative ballot. Okay, are you good? Yep. Yeah. Okay. So I guess I want to first talk about like this claim about in, in breathing. I guess, can you describe like the process of like, not like the process, but like, can you explain to me like what happens? Like do the fish escape and then it happens or is it like, does it happen within a pen? Like how does it happen? No, so it happens within a pen, that's precisely the problem. So they um, put the wrong fish in the pen in the first place? No, that's not what we're saying. We're saying that when fish are put in a pen together, they're going to have to eventually reproduce with their genetic relatives. That's going to happen if we can find a species into a singular space. So why doesn't it just... Actually, that's irrelevant. I was going to ask a question when I realized something. Um, the last argument you made about like toxic algae, like existing in places outside of the U.S. or like existing within the U.S. Um, like I guess why like things like climate change also affect like how algae blooms occur. Why is the affirmative like a, like what evidence do you have to say that aquaculture specifically increased the production of algae blooms? Right. 
So we do have evidence the GOCOL card says that the um, increased nitrogen and phosphorus from agriculture contributes to these harmful algae blooms. And in accelerating it in the affirmative world, we are allowing for more of those harmful what nitrogen. About places like near shore aquacultures or like places like that. Like obviously those have aquacultures, so obviously those have algae blooms too, if like the way that you were describing how they occur is correct. So like why isn't that? So we're just saying that in order to pretty much you know, keep it as continued as possible, we shouldn't be accelerating something that's going to continue contributing to the So basically your problems. impact has already happened. Your our only argument is that aquacultures might produce some more. It's going to get worse if we accelerate open water aquaculture. Okay, but regardless, it doesn't extend to the imp like to the impacts that we presented because we have presented an impact that like it says it's existential. We're saying your impact already happened. How do you compare those two impacts? So the the impacts of Sorry, are you saying your impact of It's actually or... fine. Um, we can move on. The arguments you made about like how we don't address species or or like species and oh that's about to soon. Uh, or the argument you made about economic stability and how like we cause economic in cause economic instability because we make it impossible for people to like access like the costs because of costs and we don't solve hunger. I guess like why does like what is your argument for why like increasing supply doesn't actually create like lower prices? Right. So I think what you're kind of trying to get at is our Diorco 2019 card, um, which tells us that food scarcity re results from distribution rather than supply, as enough supply exists to feed almost the entire world in the status quo. This means that the increases in food supply. Well, how does that account for the decrease in price? Right. So there's already like an excess of food and the prices aren't being decreased. We're not seeing that happen. It's Where is, good. like, what food is there excess of? Right, it says there's enough, um, enough food. Like, regardless of whether or not there's enough food to, like, feed the entire, feed the entire earth, that's, like, a, like, by 2050s, that doesn't really make any sense, considering we have said that a lower prices will, like, allow distribution to occur to these populations. Right, so that doesn't really account for infrastructure, and I also do want to say that interbreeding is going to mean that there is a less supply of fish. Your yields are going to be lower. It's going to be less beneficial in the long run to, to accelerate to this open water. What aquaculture. scale does this in, the interbreeding happen on? Um, actually, Douglas Tave says that uh, interbreeding is inevitable in open, open water aquaculture. I don't have a statistic on like the exact scale, but it is inevitable, especially if you're like partaking in selective so, breeding. So, like this is. This is obviously already happening in current aquacultures that are in the open ocean. Does, does it happen in, and it happens in all aquacultures? I guess like it yielding lower fish rates. If you're saying that we already have enough like fish to feed, or if we already have enough food to feed the entire world, why is that like? How does that scale at all? Right. So we're at time, but I can try to sum it. I mean, it's basically just, we will have less fish, and there's no point in accelerating it just to have less. We will have less fish. Okay, um, we have two minutes starting now.
Negative, are you ready? Mm -hmm. All three judges with me. The reality of what is at stake is whether or not billions of people now and in the future get a chance to survive childbirth, or whether or not they get to grow old and watch their children get married. What's at stake is whether or not climate change becomes so bad that the Florida debaters in this room will lose their homes as a result of ocean rise from climate change. What is at stake is whether or not environmental racism is exasperated as a result of environmental degradation and the effects of climate change. Any way you frame it, the stakes could not be larger. Which is why it is important to note that the resolution specifically uh, posits the question of whether or not it would be desirable to accelerate open ocean aquaculture. The negative has conceded that this means that they are forced to present a counter, all, a counter advocacy to the affirmative or defend the status quo. All of their arguments about why, uh, 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 about why offshore aquaculture or nearshore aqu aquaculture is bad or why aquaculture is not currently effective in the status quo are advantages for the affirmative because only accelerating with the U.S. model allows us to solve for hidden hunger, the degradation of, of the ocean, and climate change as a result of forwarding a more sustainable model as proven by the Hawaii example. Uh, the the uh, negative in the last speech makes it a question of numbers, whether or not we can see these impacts. But we have read evidence in this round talking about the 3.1 billion people starving, billions of people suffering from uh, hidden hunger, and, and, and the existential threats of climate change and uh, uh, the ocean demise. Meaning that if it's a question of number numbers, the affirmative wins every time. The only impact the negative can functionally go for at the end of the debate is the question of whether whether or not cancer is bad. TC and I agree that cancer is bad, but we believe that one, it is problematic that they can't specifically cite what kinds of cancer are caused as a result of the uh, of salmon, meaning that you should be skeptical of their claims in the first place. Two, it imagines that salmon is the only cause of cancer and it is somehow the burden of the affirmative to deal with cancer writ large. That's obviously not possible three it, uh, the, it fundamentally comes down to whether or not it is better to have more people survive their childhood and die at 70 of cancer or to not survive childhood at all the first argument that the negative uh, makes uh, in their last speech is about starvation and lack of access to the increased levels of fish. But one, um, a, a, economies of scale would solve for this. The resolution posits that a worldwide uh, aquaculture would be accelerated, meaning that there would be a surf, uh, that there would be certainly enough fish to feed the global population, if not a, sur a surplus. Uh, next, they don't have any examples of. Um, uh, they, they don't have any contextual um, understanding of the way NGOs and aquacultures have related to each other in the status quo and non-governmental organizations interest in uh, uh, feeding the population would help to solve some of the distribution arguments uh, that they're attempting to go for. Next, they say that we would make biodiversity uh, worse because of dead zones, but they, uh, they totally dropped our argument about uh, conservation aquacultures that uh, revitalize dead zones and solve all of their algae bloom arguments, which I'll talk about more at the beginning, but you'll recall at the end, but you'll recall from CrossEx that uh, conservation aquacultures are functionally small ecosystems, and as a result of what spills out of those ecosystems and the ecosystems themselves, dead zones become what was once a place of nothing, a place of life and health for the ocean, which spills up writ large. Next, they make arguments about why small corporations wouldn't be involved in, uh, in, in the affirmative plan. One, they don't have an impact to this argument, so I don't think it means anything for your ballot, but two, the model that the U.S. would be forwarding is Hawaii, which is an example of a, uh, of a, of a smaller operation, uh, and we can prove that because we have read evidence that says the U.S. is 17th in aquaculture production. 
Next, they uh, properly extend the cancer disad. Well, what I'll uh, further answer this by saying one, they imagine that uh, the only fish that uh, uh, aquaculture would produce is salmon. This ignores things like mullet, shrimp, and clams, meaning that the impact of the salmon argument is even smaller uh, than, uh, than you initially, uh, than they want uh, you to think to. Uh, I answered uh, um, uh, the, the majority of this argument in the impact overview, so I will not reinvent the wheel, but I will say that they dropped the alternative like insects, soy, and veggie to feed the salmon to get rid of the even presence of this chemical that they posit causes an unknown type of cancer does not uh, means that none of this matters. On the inbreeding argument, they say um, that uh, that. Um, uh, inbreeding would mean that, that envi the environment would be worse because it would cause uh, uh, fish populations not to be healthy. But they, this is simply a question of the survival of the fittest. If you have lived in a pen your entire life and then uh, then find yourself escaping the aquaculture, it is more it is, it is significantly unlikely that you will be able to survive in the open ocean in a regular wildlife environment. Second, in a, uh, some degree of inbreeding is inevitable in the open ocean, and that has not caused any major impacts uh, next you and you should not let the uh, perfect be the enemy of the good next is their algae be, uh, be bloom argument they make the uh, case uh, they posit that it would be that aquacultures would be the singular cause that's simply not true climate change causes algae blooms to be worse uh, meaning uh, that we solve the root cause and deep water currents solve this issue and the u.s would be modeled because it's this uh, because of our soft power and our our forwardings of climate change movements like the paris climate I'll take me two minutes starting now. Time starts now. You are going to be evaluating this round on which side of the eye, or yeah, which side of the debate is more likely to, or is less likely to ensure eco, or ecological collapse. That's going to be the negative. But let's get into this really quickly. So first, my opponents have two arguments coming out of the entire debate. The first is uh, the first is starvation, and the second is climate change. There is no internal link into starvation. They never specifically tell us that when we increase aquaculture, we are going to go ahead and actually alleviate starvation. They say people are hungry now, but they never say they're actually going to get the food. That we go ahead and sever that internal link. Remember that 
DRPO evidence in 2019 specifically says that the issue is not the supply of food. Notice they never once read a card saying we didn't have enough food. They're going to be cleanly extending at that throughout the rest of the round. Our argument is that it's infrastructure, it's bad governance, and um, it's one other thing that I might remember in a little bit. Let's keep going. So next on to climate change. They bring up climate change. There, again, is no true internal link to this. They don't really talk about livestock. And when they do talk about climate change, they talk about like environmental degradation and helping these specific areas. So they have no impact coming out of that. They read to you a lot of cards. They read to you a lot of other things. But at the end of the day, there is no reason why this is desirable. You're not going to be wanting to vote for a team that can't prove that something's act or uh, if they can't prove something will actually happen if this food will actually get to people. With that being said, you're going to be, uh, let's go to, yeah, let's keep going on to the affirmative speech. They say that we're going to be able to conserve these specific, specific habitats. And they say, well, we don't touch on like these other sorts of things, their model. Like they say it's a Hawaii model. Like we all know that it's multi-tropic aquaculture. They literally say it's different organisms coming together and they never read specific evidence that says that it's going to help, it's, uh, help, uh, help these environments. Furthermore, they're warranting as to why this multi-tropic aquaculture or this Hawaii-based model would work is because one, the U.S. is leading it. Since when is like the U.S. the pillar of, or not the pillar of excellence, but like the like pillar of economic policy that other countries like uh, that they actually go ahead and implement? I would say that that's not really probable. Um, then. They also say, or yeah, they say climate change is an existential threat, but they don't actually link into this. But let's go on to, let's go on to the really big argument that's going to make or break this round today, and it's access to food. I'm going to make it really simple for you. At the end of the day, my opponents are saying that we're going to have act more access to food with aquaculture, and we're saying that aquaculture is redundant and it's going to decrease the access to food. So let's look at the two warrants, the two reasons as to why they say this and we say that. So they say there's going to be an increase of access to food because right now people are hungry and there are going to be economies of scale, large economies of scale. They say this over and over and over again. You are not buying in to the economies of scale argument because of the interbreeding arguments and the harmful algae blooms arguments that we specifically say decrease the access to this food supply. Specifically on the TAVE 99 evidence for interbreeding, my opponents say that like this is like really old evidence. This is pretty much the only ink they put on this argument. However, we would say that it's still really, it's still very true. He's talking about these small spaces that these fish are combined into that eventually uh, are going to lead to this sort of interbreeding. And Waters specifically, Waters 2020 specifically says that this decreases chances of survival leading to lower yields. They have no access or to their argument about an increased food supply because yields are lowering. We literally give you our, our evidence specifically right there. That is where you are voting for the negative in today's round. My opponents start off this speech saying that like uh, our, us as Floridians should choose this sort of uh, policy that we know is going to help them with climate change. I would say us as Floridians would rather go ahead and implement a policy that we know doesn't like create harmful algae blooms and eventually depletes our environments. Um, but let's talk about harmful algae blooms because that's another reason why you're going to be voting for negative in today's round. We specifically say, they say like ocean currents are this reason why like harmful algae blooms aren't happening in the affirmative world. One, I would say that warranting isn't very good, but also the Google evidence specifically says open ocean aquaculture, there, it's like a whole like study about the Red Sea and as to like why these different areas, um, are, there is an associated increase in all of these, uh, or in, in phosphorus and in harmful algae blooms because of these excess and nutrients. There is a direct association between the two with open ocean aquaculture. They say that like there's these, uh, these waves. You're not gonna buy into that when we give you specific evidence and specific warranting. You're going to be voting for the negative in today's round very clearly because the EPA says that a decrease in the food supply, so they say that we're gonna increase it. We give you many reasons as to why it's going to decrease, but an decrease in the food supply 
or it, uh, is very harmful when we have like problematic agriculture. But moreover, Iman says that a 10% increase in food prices leads to 10 million people pushed into poverty. Moreover, the UN says that um, when food prices increase, or when food prices increase, a hundred million people are going to be pushed into starvation. All the while, not mitigating climate change and allowing for dead zones, so that we have no food chains and we have no food at the end. You're voting for the negative. Thank you. I'm totally up for the answer. Okay. <laughs> Yeah. 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 Yeah.
<laughs> I'd like to congratulate both uh, Florida State, Wake Forest on an outstanding final round. This is always the highlight of my year, a tournament where we get together. I know that there are going to be great arguments. I also know that it's going to be communicated to the world the best that we have to offer as a way in which debate can serve as an opportunity to bring people together where we figure out how to wrestle with some of the key core issues that we're challenged by in the world, whether we're talking about food insecurity or the myriad of other issues that we've debated here. So congratulations for holding up uh, and serving as a model for the way in which we should all be debating. The decision was a 3-0 for Wake Forest. Here's, the, uh, right now, the way in which I'm just deciding this, that I know that there's just a significant amount of starvation that is going on in the world, that there are three billion people who lack food, there's lots of food hitting hunger that is going on currently, and it, that is a significant problem that is baked within the way in which the current world operates, and that we should figure out a way to resolve that particular issue. The affirmative offers a proposal for us to do open ocean aquaculture that would hopefully resolve that particular set of concerns and problems. I do think, uh, Florida State, that you have made some compelling arguments about how there are some production concerns about whether or not the United States can serve as a sufficient model for others, and even whether or not the technology would produce some inbreeding that would decrease yield. But on none of those arguments do I come to the conclusion that there would be no yields, or that I even know how much lower the yields would be. So I think that you have some compelling arguments for why we should be skeptical about whether or not the affirmative would resolve all of the problems or solve for all of the starvation that they identified in the 1AC. I, don't, I do think that the affirmative can do some things to move us in the direction of addressing these problems. And I don't have an external reason for why this would be harmful to us. So one of the things that I think that you would maybe want to add to your argument set is here are some negative consequences that would occur if we did ocean aquaculture that's not connected to feeding people. Something with an impact that's outside of the conversation of global warming or food production. But overall, a very good set of arguments and I've enjoyed listening to both of the debates that I got to judge. Thank you. Again, more than that. First of all, let me just echo what, what, what Ed just said in terms of just a clear privilege to be here and, and watch these such an amazing debates. You all are amazing representatives, not only for your institutions, uh, but all but yourselves and, 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 and the communities in which you come from. And I'm proud to be associated with you and call you a part of my debate family. So I just want to just echo that. and. You all are destined to do amazing and wonderful things, and I'm just glad to have played a part in, in, your, in, your, in your, your growth and what you're doing today. So uh, with that being said, a couple of things come to mind. One, uh, I do think if you, the negative, you make it really hard for you in, without having a counter plan in this debate. Uh, you put a lot of on these particular asset, access arguments. Uh, and the reason, is similar to Ed, is that I do think you probably mitigate some. There's probably some level of, of access that, that, that doesn't happen, about, but not enough to, to not vote for the affirmative. And they still are making some arguments that, uh, you know, NGOs may be able to fill in, some other folks may be able to, to come and provide some resources that allow for us to deal with the hunger question. I, I still also think that they're, when they're doing a better job in terms of articulating why there still may be some modeling that would take place from the United States taking the lead. Uh, what I heard in the last rebuttal was more like, it, it, I think you could do more work there mm -hmm. to kind of push back against that. So I do think they're winning some level of their modeling arguments also gets them to access not just the food arguments in this debate, but the climate change arguments some too. Uh, and I think that that is a huge impact as well. Uh, your argument about, you know, they don't get an internal link. I do think that there's a level in which modeling as well as these conservation 
uh, arguments that they're saying that they come with open agriculture, uh, aquaculture, I think are compelling as well. So it's a, it's a risk that they will also turn that or turn that back around that trend, uh, which I think is important because in many ways that's probably the biggest impact in my mind in this debate, even though I think the food argument is the most time frame friendly argument for them to win. Uh, but I think on both fronts they are ahead uh, that the, the app may not be 100% going to solve everything, but absent having a counter plan and having any other alternative to look at, it is the best option for me by the time the end of this debate comes. So uh, that's the debate in short and skinny. Happy to talk some more after uh, Professor Hayes provides his, his, his feedback. Um, I'd like to echo excellent debate by both teams. Really enjoyed watching it. I learned a lot from this tournament about how we produce food and the challenges that we're facing. And I think that's really one of the great things that debate does. It brings us together and forces us in a really intense manner to think through some of these issues. Um, I'd echo what um, my colleagues have said about giving the affirmative enough of an advantage of a huge impact. Um, and that really is where I sort of start my decision. But I'll also talk a little bit about the defense. Um, so you make the point, it's about distribution of food, not just how much food we're producing. It does make sense to me, though, that if supply goes up, price goes down, and people are easier able to get that food. You all, by the way, read evidence saying that at the bottom of your speech. So really, you all are providing the evidence that's the internal link to getting the food out there. You all could have picked up on that, because they also did it in the middle of the debate as well. On the interbreeding argument, um, I don't really understand. I understand how interbreeding would decrease yields within the captured net. So like within that net, the yields go down, but not necessarily how these fish get out and decrease yields anywhere else. It makes sense to me that if they have problems, they're going to die. So this impact is really localized to a single net. So it's like they create the net, the yields go up because there's fish stocks there that or wouldn't be there before, then they interbreed at worst case, so maybe the yields are less than they otherwise would have been, but if they're the otherwise scenario, there's no deep ocean pen anyway. And so I'm not sure even if you don't give them any defense on what we can introduce genetic diversity, the people who have a profit incentive to look and see how many fish are in here can breed and sort of deal with those issues. So I think you're getting a little bit of defense there, but I don't understand the explanation of how this is going to impact overall yields or why we couldn't adapt to that. I think that probably your best offense is the algae bloom argument. I'm not sure about the deep currents argument. I know that y'all aren't really responding to their argument on getting the internal link to climate change being a big link to algae blooms as well. Also, there's this notion, oh, we already have aquaculture. It's already coming, but right now it's offshore and that's even worse because we don't have deep currents. And so if the U.S. can lead and make it modeled and maybe we take this offshore, maybe algae blooms are not as bad with the affirmative team than they would be sort of in the status quo. So bottom line, I'm giving them, you know, there's this huge impact and I'm giving them some progress on solving it. I think some of y'all's evidence helps them with that, although they didn't really jump on that. And I think y'all's defense, you're making some ground, but it's not necessarily enough to get all the way there, you know. Um, the only thing uh, else I just randomly mentioned is I've seen y'all debate now, I think, three times. And it, TC in particular is by far the best speech I've seen from you. I mean, I don't know if you said anything different in this speech than the first time I saw you, but just the strategic organization, how you put it together, really made a big difference in terms of easy to comprehend, easy to follow. Um, I thought it was a really good example of you adapting to the format you're in right now which I know is not the format any of you practice, because as Jared mentioned, this is sort of a compromised format between everyone's format of choice. So I really wanted to compliment y'all, because I've seen that progress of iterations from round to round to today, and it was really quite great. So. Yeah, this is my first time seeing you. It was great to see you. And I would say Florida State, this was, that, this was even a better debate than one I saw earlier. So I know it wasn't the outcome you desired, but, okay. but if you look at you just look at here. You know, like, to say, Hey, there you go. Fair enough. But, Kudos to everyone. Thank you. One quick thing that I would suggest, and I don't know how relevant specific for know going on in debating. When, when we have these sort of, sort of macroeconomic conversations, like it, ultimately the sort of production, overproduction, uh, is it about politics? Is it about supply? 
But I think that it would be helpful to be more specific about countries, the, the process, like, in, like really what I think a lot of the evidence is talking about are really about import substitutions that we, we have countries who we send a bunch of goods, it undermines local production, and that there are sort of political choices that get made that crowds out the de local developmental processes. And I'm not quite sure if the app does any of that just because of the way in which fish farming takes place. Uh, that you're making an argument that others would model something like Hawaii, and I think that you should argue that those are small-scale localized economies that would not be about importing and exporting fish from one place, but really about local economic development where it gets used there. So, so digging in a little bit more about process of what's happening would be really useful uh, in controlling the way in which we read and think about the data. And, and, it, and it, to his point, that could be true for the app that in long term, but to the negative, that could be a place where you can say in the short term, it undermines local economies, causing all kinds of political chaos, unrest. Mm -hmm. So there's an opportunity to create some disadvantage, mm -hmm. disadvantage grounds as opposed to, so it makes the debate even more nuanced and richer in, yeah. in, in, in the future. But, but yeah, good luck everybody. Hey. Have a good rest of the evening and congratulations on getting to the championship round of the